we thank the choir for their rendition. Yes, put your hands together and praise God for it. I'm in a teaching mode today and uh, running about 10 minutes behind schedule. So it means I will run 10 minutes over schedule. Well, I wasn't apologizing, just announcing. <laughs> That's what's going to be. The day is very serious. On the fourth Sabbath of the month, next week is Youth Sabbath, on the fourth Sabbath of the month, I will get into the crippling effects of this planet on underprivileged people. I will deal with the black family in particular, but also with families under pressure, whatever the race. And we will go into Genesis 3 and look at the first family and how destructive sin was on their relationship, Adam and Eve, and move from there to some other things as well. I want to begin today, and the ushers now come, come ushers, please, please, please. They're passing out a handout. I'm going to trust you not to sit and read it till I get to it. I'll be to it in about 15 minutes. You're getting a handout that describes the four temperaments. The choleric, the melancholic, sanguine, and the phlegmatic temperament, and the weaknesses and strengths of both. Now, while you're getting that, let me explain to you that when it comes to temperaments, is everybody listening? When it comes to temperaments, there is no good and bad in terms of a, of a temperament per se. A sanguine temperament is no worse than a melancholic temperament. But all temperaments have strengths and weaknesses. Is that understandable? The premise of the sermons this month is this. You can't be one with anybody until you've become one with yourself. And that oneness with self is only achieved in the same degree as you are unified with Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Well, whether it does or not, it's the truth. It's just the plain old truth. Most people who can't get along with other people are people who really can't get along with themselves. And that, listen to me, their conflicts with other people derive from the conflicts within themselves. A person who is mean and hard to get along with is really mad at themselves. They've just never admitted it. The insecure person in relationships who's always trying to pull from another person their self-worth. And let me tell you right now, you want to avoid like leprosy, getting tied up with anyone who's insecure. Because they will always be digging their emotional fangs into you, trying to get self-worth from you that they don't have in themselves. Such a person is an emotional parasite and they will destroy you. But it's self-understanding. I am convinced from these years I have pastored, and from many, many counseling sessions, particularly marriage counseling sessions, that conflict between spouses is because of conflicts the individual spouses have never solved within themselves. And now they're beating up their partner with their brokenness. One of my frustrations is that so often when couples come to me for counseling, the problem is they usually bring, come to me for counseling wanting me to get their spouse straight. 
they'll sit there piously and say, now, Pastor, I'm not perfect, but they should just stop right there. I'm not perfect. No but after it. Because until you can deal with your own imperfections, how dare you demand perfection of somebody else? So it's a serious presentation today. And before I'm done, some will feel quite uncomfortable. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit, not the work of Henry Wright. Shall we pray? Bless us today, Lord, in what we seek to do. In Christ's name, amen. I want to just recognize... Uh, uh, someone who's been uh, listening, uh, a brother, uh, Daniel Christo Spiro. I hope he's watching now. He watches us from Australia and has been thanking the pastors for these sermons on oneness. And I want you to know, Daniel, that we're praying for you and the things that you shared with me in the email. Open your Bibles, please. I'm going to begin this sermon by reviewing. I got fussed at all week by email, by text, and by call because I did not really do all six of my points last week. I'm going to review them in five minutes. Put them on the board, please, up on the screen. First, read it. Marriage requires two singles who are trying to reflect God's image. That was number one. And the text we used there was Genesis 1, 26. Number two, no, we're not going to read it, brother. Go back to number two. Read, marriage needs two people who know how to partner. And we stress sharing, sharing. Marriage demands that you come out of yourself and give firstness to another person. Now remember, when I presented these, we're saying this is the kind of single person you ought to be before you consider being married. I'll say amen for you. Uh, number three from next, uh, last week's sermon, read, marriage needs requires someone who knows marriage's priorities. And the priority of marriage is putting another person first. This is why marriage is the one relationship, let me repeat myself, that the Bible consistently compares to God's relationship with us. Because to have a relationship with God, you must put God where? First. But don't just apply it to marriage. In a friendship, in a buddyship, that's the opportunity to practice putting another person first. If you have to be first, first all the time then just stay by yourself don't plague me with you uh, number four read come on marriage is for someone who knows how to stay with it it's commitment folk marriage is not an experiment we stand before the pastor all pious She's dressed in white. He's dressed in black. Of course, the more modern marriages now, they wear anything. But in the old days, <laughs> Lord help the old pastor. But, 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 it, it, you know, it, it, tell death, do his part. And we say it. Everybody says amen. amen. No, tell death, tell death. Death means you ain't breathing no more. That's when you're out of the marriage. Now, sometimes, see, I'm a nice guy. Sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes the death of the marriage is before you stop breathing. See, somebody just breathed a sigh of relief because they, 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 they've been divorced. They just felt real bad. Now I'm giving you relief. Sometimes the marriage is dead before you are. Let the church say amen. All right. Everybody's my buddy now. Number five, read. Marriage needs maturity to understand, not always agree. In other words, the essence of marriage is understanding, not agreement. Henry Wright, Carol Wright, we're not the same. We don't always agree. Even after 50 years of marriage, we don't always agree. But she understands me. I understand her. Enough to know when to shut up and move on out of the room. 
Go find something to do. Let the brethren say amen. You're not going to win. You're not going to win that, brother. Just find something to do. Go, go do a jigsaw puzzle. Do anything. But you, that's over. See, understanding. Not agreement. Understanding. That's the key. And then uh, number six. Marriage requires two people who can withstand vulnerability. And we talked about the fact, and so now you got all six. We talked about the fact that in, a, any, in any kind of friendship, especially marriage, you must be able to be vulnerable. See, tall, dark, and handsome, and quiet ain't good. You need to know what this person is thinking. I'll say amen for you. So if you're not ready to be vulnerable, if you're not ready for a person to see you as you really are, stay single. Don't try to be friends. Because relationships require exposure. And so that's why we say, and I, I told you last week, I, you know, I don't, if, if, if you come to me for counseling and relationship counseling, you've only known each other a few weeks, just don't, don't call me. Because you don't know enough to receive counseling. You need to be with this person for a, a while. Isn't that right? See them when they're angry. See them when they're just off from work. See them when they forgot to brush their teeth. See them. See them. And be able to ask yourself, see, now and here's, here's the key, here's the key, here's the key, here's the key, balcony, here's the key. Ask yourself this question. If the worst thing you know about them never changes for 50 years, are you willing to live with it? You got to marry choir what is, not what you hope is. And so a person must be willing to be vulnerable. Isn't that right? That's why, see, and that, that, see, that's why, that's why I like the church, my brother. Because the purpose of the church is to remove all pretense. Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. Remove all, just come in here and be as we are in Christ, broken, fixed, strong, weak. We ought not ever have to pretend in church. Amen. But that's what we do. Okay, that's the six. Now. Let's move on. Let's talk about the brain and its structure. Take your fists. Take your fists. Both fists. Come on, choir. Show them how to do it. And do this. Okay? Do this. Do this. You're now looking at the front of the brain. It's called the frontal lobes. Frontal lobes. Okay, keep the fists there. Everybody with me? Balcony, fists, fists. Okay, here we go. Now, the brain has four quadrants. How many? Okay. The upper left. The upper left. Let me get my brain picture up there. Brain picture, brethren. All right, it'll get it up there in a minute. They're working on it. The upper left is the quadrant that prioritizes. Prioritizes. Upper left. Prioritizes. Okay? The lower left, move your finger down. The lower left, that's the quadrant that organizes. With me? The left side of the brain is the decision-making part of the brain. It's called the cognitive side. Right brain. Let's go over there. The upper right visualizes. What does it do? What does the upper left do? Uh-huh. And then the lower right, lower right, I haven't done that one yet. The lower right harmonizes. What does it do? Let's review. Upper right visualizes. Upper left Lower left, lower right. So the brain has four main functions. 
to prioritize, to organize, to visualize, and to what? Harmonize. Harmonize. Now, you did that this morning when you got dressed for church. Because when you woke up, you decided what was the most important thing to do, didn't you? Uh, Most of us have a a routine. And so, Hesky, when I got up, to my knees. Pray. Thank you, Lord. You woke me up one more time. Then I went to my worship books. Did that. Then from there, from there, while doing my worship, I shifted to the lower part of my left side because I have to organize how I'm going to do my worship. I'm going to read the devotional book first. I'm going to read my passage of scripture second. And then I'm going to take notes third. So I both prioritized and organized. Are you with me so far? Okay. Then I went from there to visualizing. I go into the bathroom. And there I've got to get myself ready for church. Okay? So I visualized myself in a gray suit with a white shirt, the lavender, okay? And the handkerchief with the stripes. Yeah, yeah. I visualized it. Before I put it on, I visualized it. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yeah. Did pretty good, didn't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then, and then from there, from there, before it's all done, I harmonized it in my mind. I went into the room, Sister Wright, I showed her three ties. Which tie would you pick? She picked this one. Give her a hand. Yeah. And now I'm harmonized. Now you do this every day without thinking, don't you? You shift from one part of the brain all the time. Prioritize, organize, visualize, harmonize. You do this every day. Some people do that when they eat. Every day. Everything you do, you use these quadrants. Are you with me so far? Everybody listening? Now, the next part I'm going to teach you, some folk disagree with this. But my experience in counseling has told me this is valid. Studies are showing that each person has a lead quadrant. And that lead quadrant determines their temperament. Okay? Now, some of you have heard this before. It's old hat, but just stay with me because I'm headed somewhere. Some people, by nature, tend to be a prioritizing person. And people who are that way, let's shift to the next slide that, that defines these. And now you're looking at your sheet. People who, who, who lead with that upper left They are called choleric. What are they called? They're choleric. People who lead with that lower left, the organizing quadrant, are called melancholic. What are they called? Melancholic. People who lead from the right upper, the quadrant that visualizes, they're called sanguine. What are they called? Sanguine. And people who lead most of the time from the lower right, People who tend to be more harmonious and gentle, they're called phlegmatic. What are they called? Phlegmatic. Every person sitting in this room has a lead quadrant. And a secondary quadrant. Your pastor is melancholic choleric. I'm an organizer. All you have to do is listen to me preach a sermon. All my sermons follow the same pattern, if you really listen. Now, those who have never really listened to me don't know that, but if you really listen. (laughs) I organize things in my head first. Then I prioritize what I'm going to do with it. But because I'm a melancholic choleric, that has produced in me certain kinds of of tendency. Look at the sheet. Look at the sheet. So the melancholic person, look down at the sheet. You see on the positive side, I work well alone. I'm a planner. I like charts and graphs. Organized. I like quiet. I like quiet. It's very unnatural for me to be standing in front of you and preaching. This is the Lord in me. I'd rather be sitting up there in that balcony 
quiet by myself. Now, I am proof. Hey! Watch me now. I'm proof that when God gets in you, hey, he can override the temperament. Somebody say hallelujah. I do. My temperament does not belong up front. Don't like it? Thank you so much, America, for the word of encouragement. Says I do a good job. Praise God. God gets all the glory. This is not naturally me. Growing up at home, you couldn't get me to stand up in front of people and do anything. I'd be so nervous I couldn't see. So I am proof that your temperament doesn't have to be your master. Jesus is your master. I'm also, my secondary is choleric. Besides being organized, I'm a person who's an activist. I'm decisive. I love challenges. That's why I'm pastoring to come of our church. I like challenges. Give the Lord a hand, huh? Yes. Leader, organized. That's, that's the positive side. Oh, but look at the pastor's negative side. You're praying now. Praying now. Melancholic. Look at there. Easy depressed. I never experienced that. Naive, idealistic, can be. Threat you to extremes. Yes, yes. I watch the money. You've seen that in church, haven't you? Pastor has you look at that grass. I watch the money. Doesn't do well under pressure. Doesn't apply to me. I do quite well under pressure. Um, needs time to do things. Kinda. Hard to please. Sorta. Self-centered. Can be pessimistic, sometimes moody, can be revengeful. Watch me now. <laughs> okay, okay. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing, Clark. I, I want y'all to listen. They'll get it. When you look at those negatives of my main quadrant, what does that tell you? I need to be in the hands of Jesus. Isn't that right, Clark? See, see, folk, listen to me. Now I'm getting into the sermon part. I'm trying to show you today that Satan was watching when God formed the human brain. He knows about the quadrants. He knows how to tap. You see, if you study Moses, Moses was a melancholic. He was a melancholic. You don't mess with Moses. That's why he killed a man. He killed him. Don't mess with Moses. He'll take you out. And yet Jesus said, talking about, Mo, talking about the power of the Holy Ghost, Jesus called him the meekest man that ever lived. Give God some glory. I'm trying to tell you, you've got to take that stuff and give it to God. So whatever you find out about yourself today, don't get discouraged. Get on your knees. So these are characteristics I have to deal with. How many of you are going to pray for your pastor? Now pray for me. Now I have confessed publicly. Publicly. See, so you know now, like in the board meeting, board members, if you see me getting a little quiet, you need to pray. Because <laughs> I'm wrestling with Henry Wright. See, because I can come out of my, I, I, can, I, I can get sharp on the, I can get sharp. My tongue can become a razor. You see that happening, uh, Sister Clerk? Romania, she sits right by me in board meeting. Just put your hand on my, put your hand on my, on my arm. Pray, Lord, keep him, hold him, brothers and sisters, until we can trust each other with each other. How can we be one? See, rather than talking about folk, pray for people. There are a lot of times. When husbands and wives are going at one another, they need to just shut up and pray. Let me say it softer. A lot of times, when it's rough at home, what y'all need to do is stop discussing that thing, because it ain't going nowhere, and pray. A lot of bad stuff would never happen at home if the two people would just shut up and pray. Would somebody please say amen? amen? See, the problem is, here's the problem, here's the problem. 
And you single folks, keep this in your mind. See, people get caught up in trying to win. You can win an argument and lose your marriage. Winning ain't everything. Jesus lost his life and saved the planet. Come on now. So look at this. Look at this. Now, look at yourself. Find yourself. If, if you were in a counseling session with me, you'd have to take this sheet and circle everything that applies to you. I'd give you five minutes to do that. And then I have an evaluation process I go through. So take the sheet home and don't lie. Don't, 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 don't circle decisive when you can't make a decision. Just don't circle that. Be honest. Go home by yourself and circle what applies. Is that all right? If you're married, you and your spouse together, do it. And then trade the sheets and see what you see. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing, my brother. Until you can face how you are, then you're never going to be safe in a relationship. So, so, let's keep going. So, with, 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 these, with, these, with these brain leads, and you can see some of the key things that, 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 go, that go with you. And I need everybody's attention. Your temperament. Listen, listen. Your temperament, your brain lead is the reason why you're having trouble getting along with certain kinds of people. Let me explain it to you. My wife is a phlegmatic sanguine. So we both lead from the lower part of the brain. Both of us love quietness. We're joined there. Both of us love the read. We're joined there. My wife's an accountant. We're both organized. That's where we join. That's where we get along. That's where we have a good time. But she's also a sanguine. And I'm a choleric. So when brother and sister write shift gears to the upper part of the brain, choleric and sanguine, for the pastor, there's more difficulty. More difficulty. Now, stay with me. Because we've been married for 50 years, we've learned something. Here's what we've learned. Don't try to change what God created. Let me tell you, choir, why most marriages fall apart in the first five years. Because they spend the first five years trying to change what God created. See, one of the first things I ask, when a couple comes before me uh, with a marital problem and they start complaining about a particular thing in their spouse, the first question I ask is, um... Were they like that before you married them? Well, yeah. (laughs) End of session. (laughs) You married it. What do you want me to do? I ain't God. I didn't create him. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying, folk? That's what you married. Yeah, but I but I but but I thought, and here here it comes, here it comes. I don't want to offend anybody. Dumbest thing that comes out of a married person's mouth. Yeah, but I thought, I thought after they, that we married, they'd change. What? You did? If they have not first given themselves to Jesus Christ, if he has not controlled their whole life, how in the world do you think you're going to do what God has not done? Just ease up. Pray. 
Because until they choose themselves to give themselves to the Holy Ghost, all your complaining, fussing, threatening, intimidating is not going to change them. Are you with me? So, 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 we have a problem. See, they're, 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 for instance, melancholic people are very irritated by sanguine people. Because melancholic people are on time, organized. Come on, y'all. Sanguine people, time? Time? And they're not bothered. Fuck, you know I'm telling the truth. Not bothered. I'm running a little late. They come in, you know, ah, running a little late. Ah, ah. And the melancholics are going, bruh, bruh. how many of y'all know I'm telling the truth? So there's no way for these two people, somebody has to pray. Phlegmatic people are very turned off by cholerics. Phlegmatics are recessed. They don't like to take charge. And so phlegmatics consider cholerics to be bossy. And so when the choleric is up front taking charge, the phlegmatic is saying, I just wish they would shut up and sit down. How come y'all laughing? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Just, 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 you know. The flickers, the phlegmatic, this is, and, and, and the phlegmatic, they're not, see, the choleric, the, the choleric, they're upset about everything. Nothing's right. Got to be straightened out. The phlegmatic is saying, would you please take a deep breath, inhale, and let life move on? It's because of this, phlegmatics make excellent parents. See, my, my, my three sons, they grew up and are alive. Because I'm married to a phlegmatic. Because melancholic, choleric, I got one question. Do you want me to take you out right now or in the morning? Sister Wright, bless her heart, I just love her. Honey, they're just boys. They're just children. Well, if they're going to become men, they need to get out of my sight right now. Now, think about it. That's right. Now, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. We're talking about marriage. God put me with the perfect mate. Guess us the right of hand. Perfect mate. Because there are times... When my decisiveness and take charge was a blessing. There are times, we're in boys, there are times the boy needs to hear. This far, no further. No negotiation. Sit down. Shut up. And you have that posture on you that says, sit down, shut up. Now, in that moment, Sister Wright is praying. She's praying. We become a team there. The boys know at a certain point, don't try to get around Dad. And because we're a team, don't go to Mom to get around Dad. See, over the years we've learned, they come to her with certain things, you need to talk to your father. That's not what they want to do. But now they know they can't get around. There are times when my nature, they come to me, you need to talk to your mom. Because what they're saying to me makes no sense at all. <laughs> None. <laughs> Go talk to your mom. And then she'll come to me and explain why this craziness should be permitted. <laughs> what I'm saying to you folk is, you need to give thought seriously 
while you're single as to whether you match up because love alone will not keep a marriage alive. Good sense will. Did y'all get that? Now, we're going to read some text of Scripture. I'm going to let you go home. Take your Bible. John 16, 13. The text I used at the beginning of Sermon 1. But now you'll understand it in a much different light. John 16, 13. What did the pastor say? Let's read it again together. Come on, y'all. I'm enjoying you so much. You're being such a good class. Come on, everybody together. However, when he, the spirit of truth, he will... Pause. I taught you last week that text means guide you to all truth about what? Yourself. Yourself. The first thing the spirit does before you choose a mate or before you form a deep friendship, Nicole, the first thing the spirit does is reveal to you yourself. So you know, my brother, who you are. Now, listen to me. There are folks you can be friends with, but everybody you can be friends with is not somebody you can marry. Choir agrees. The choir agrees with me. This choir agrees with me. Okay? So he reveals to yourself. This is why we have church. This is why we have positions in church. This is why we have various, as the choir has four parts, because most parts choirs don't sing bass anymore, which offends me deeply. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother pet peeve of mine about gospel music. Sing some bass! But anyhow, okay. But, 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 but the fact the choir has three or four parts, you, you do best when you sing the part your voice fits. Okay? So you do best when you marry the person that fits with you. And that takes time. What does it take? Okay. Spirit of truth has come. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears about you, he'll reveal to you and show you things to come. Let's go to the next text. Next text. This time, we're going to Lamentations 340. Lamentations is a little book after Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Lamentations. Lamentations 3, what verse? 40. Ah, ah, you see that text? You like it? Let's read it. Come on. Let us search out. And turn back to the Lord. Let me translate it for you. Let us search, Lisa, to know who we are. Finding out, let's take who we are back to the Lord. Why are there some people in church you can't get along with? Do not be too quick to blame them. Because I'm convinced that the Lord has placed every person, Elder O'Neill, in the church as a tool to shape their pastor. Yes, ma'am. I believe that. I believe that. And I always thank God for people in the church that it's more difficult for me to get along with. Because those people, if I learn, will get me into heaven. The fact that I can get along with you does not prove I'm saved. But when I can get along with the person I don't like, now I know I'm saved. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. And the mistake we make in church is, uh, 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 Robert Smith, we, we, pile up, we pile up with the folks we like. That's not Christianity. Uh, and cliques and groups in the church based on sameness are not proof that God is in this place. But when we can cross lines and races and nationalities and languages and pile up, 
then this church is on its way to the kingdom of heaven. This business of my circle of friends. I got nothing against it. I got nothing against it. Jesus had three disciples. He kind of kept close to him. But brothers and sisters, and that's why we're doing this, trying to work on this thing of us, get to know each other, get to know each other. You start with a person's name. Shake hands with everybody. Let's read that text again. Come on. Let us search out and examine our ways. Turn back. Matthew 7, 5. Matthew 7, 5. Woo! Woo! Okay, it's Jesus talking now. Read it. Hypocrite. No, no, stop, stop. I, I want him to call your name one more time. Come on. <laughs> read it. Come on. Hypocrite. Read on. First, remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck. <clears throat> Get that two by four out of your own eyeball. Now you know if you got if you got a two by four in your eye, <laughs> you got some work to do. <laughs> Can I get a witness? First place, your face is all messed up because you got a two before up in your eye. What Jesus is saying is the energy you spend working on somebody else, spend that energy working on yourself. And folk, the young people of the church need to see this out of us adults. How dare you sit around your children and criticize people in the church. How dare you sit around in the house and criticize even the pastor and then wonder why the young folk don't join the church when the pastor makes an appeal. You've told them at home that the pastor ain't got no sense. Why would they join the church under somebody who ain't got no sense? No, no, I mean, no, my, my members don't talk about me like that. You see my point? We can't be singing these songs in church, love, love, love. When the young folk of the church see other stuff, that indicates we're just singing. Love means embracing and accepting. Am I telling the truth? And keep in mind that all these different temperaments, Brother Khalees, all these different folks. See, Brother Khalees is a person, he works with the homeless. That means Brother Khalees has a non-judgmental spirit. He goes out and shares and gives and gives people dignity and a sense of acceptance. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So the person you meet at Tacoma Park Church that you find it hard to like, God sent them to the church just for you. It's the truth, isn't it? It's the truth. Oh, precious folk, I love you so much. We got to get this. We have to stop faking it in these pews. Our hearts and the doors of our hearts must open up. We have to stop, hear me choir, we have to stop even lightly joking about and making fun of people in the church. A lot of stuff said around the supper table after church is a shame before God. And we think we have the right to kind of make little jokes and funny statements. Brothers and sisters, some of these people we're making fun of are going to the kingdom of heaven. You're going to live with them for eternity. My final text. I didn't give this to you. 
I changed the sermon. See how quickly you can get to Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24. Then we're done. I'll cut a few things out. I think we got the full message here. Are you with me so far? Okay. Let me show you how serious God is about us getting along in the church. Jesus is in the midst of preaching the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> and that brother, like Jesus can do, he hits, he gets all up in our stuff and leaves me speechless and ashamed. Matthew 5. All right. Come on, Jesus, help me here now. I haven't been feeling good this week, and I'm getting tired, but i got to get this text. Okay, five. Ah, oh, they got it. Come on, y'all, let's read this. Come on. Therefore, and whenever Jesus says therefore, he's making a point. Let's read. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... Pause. No, we ain't ready to do leave yet. Pause. We can't get to leave. We got to get this. Go back to the other. Go back to the other. Now, now, notice, Chris, the wisdom of the language. See, if I had written the text, I would have said, therefore, if I bring my gift to the altar and there remember that I have something against my brother, it don't say that. It makes me responsible for my brother's feelings. In other words, Jesus says, you can come to church, Kevin, and be feeling just fine. Great. Had a great week. But you remember that your brother is upset. Don't come and worship. Keep your tithe in your pocket. Leave your, with your good feeling doing fine self and find your broken up hurting brother. Take responsibility for their pain though you have no pain at all. How many times have I had couples come before me and one will say, look, They got a problem. I'm doing just fine. And my forehead always wrinkles up. No, wait a minute. You two are one. They got a problem. You're just fine. And you're one. If they got a problem, then you got a problem. How can you be doing just fine with someone that you're one with and they're upset? How can you have food and your neighbor has none? How can you have transportation to church and your neighbor can't get there? Are you listening to me? Jesus is saying, if you're doing so great in church, ready to worship, and remember there's somebody at TPC who is scuffling and broken and afraid and alone and angry, Jesus said, Maybe that day, don't you go to church. Go visit that person whom I brought to your mind and help them get straight. Then walk in church and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. My final point today is simply this. God makes you responsible for the temperament of the person you worship with. Find a way, just as I am. Find a way. Find a way. Find a way to be one.
maybe as a result of the day's message you understand yourself a little bit better just a little bit not a whole lot see if I was giving you this same instruction in my office as a counselor we would have spent two hours together on this helping you to see who you really are helping you to stop fighting against natural tendencies and just give them to Jesus folk we're all messed up some kind of way we're all messed up there are things about my temperament I can't stand James Armstrong as part of right I don't like I don't like my stubbornness I hate it I don't like my impatience it's natural amare for a choleric to be impatient I don't like that part of myself I don't like being pushy and every day how often did I say talk to me how often did I say I got to give that stuff to Jesus. Growing up, Chris, I never liked that part of me that can hold stuff. It's a natural part of a melancholic. You do me, I'm going to do you. May take a year, may take ten. Here I come. The Lord had to give me victory over that, folk. How's the Lord going to take somebody like that to the kingdom of heaven? You listen to me? If you're not willing to admit your brokenness, you cannot be saved. So if you sat through this sermon patting yourself on the back, well, I'm not this, I'm not that, you're probably lying. Every adult sitting here has got something broken, something that needs fixing, something that's not yet bent and bowed to God. Everybody sitting here should have seen themselves under the microscope and said, Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. Here comes Jesus, Don. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. Don't you like him? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and ye shall find rest to your souls. Learn from the Jesus who had the power to wipe them out. Let him slap him. Let them kick him. Let them spit on him. Learn as this Jesus who is almighty choleric and almighty melancholic a sweet sanguine and a peaceful phlegmatic. Learn this. Watch this complete Jesus work his way around all those tendencies inherent from that horrible lineage that he had. Watch Jesus just keep subduing and subduing. And on the cross, Satan could not tap one negative thing. Beat upon, talked about, mistreated young man. Jesus held his temperament in check by the power of the Holy Ghost. I got to show Henry that you can take it. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I can see Satan say, man, I thought I had him. I thought that power and majesty would break through. Instead, he's forgiving them. Some spouses sitting here need to lay it down. Some stuff you just should lay it down. Lay it down. And some folks sitting here who've got issues with parents, lay it down. Parents got issues with children, lay it down. Church members got issues with church. Lay it down. Give it to Jesus. Work on yourself. Pray for the offender. We're either going to be Christian or we need to close this big stone building up and go on to hell. Or be Christian.
Christian. Really Christian. Practice what we preach or stop preaching it. So just I am, just as I am without one plea. So before the owner comes, Before she sings, hear me. There's some brokenness. There's some stuff about how you are as a person that this sermon kind of stepped on. And you need prayer. Today's appeal is not about joining anything, it's about joining Jesus. There's some brokenness. There's some aspects of yourself you've been making excuses for. And you know it. You want me to pray for you. Get up and come down here. Now you can sing. Who'll come? Just as I am without one plea but Pastor Chris, come and stand with me, please. I need all my elders up here standing beside me and Pastor Chris. If you're an elder, come and stand up here beside us. Every elder. The sermon has showed me, Lord, that I got a I got a choleric streak that's not under your control. The sermon has shown me, Lord, that there's a phlegmatic, phlegmatic part of me that's destroying my relationships with others. The sermon has shown me, Lord, that there's some sanguinity in me that I need to stop making excuses for and deal with. The sermon has shown me, Lord, there's some melancholic traits that if I don't overcome, I will not get to heaven. You need me to pray for you. You don't want to come, stand. You can't get down here, then stand. Stand. God will honor your standing as if you came. I know it's too far for somebody to come, then stand. And don't be ashamed if you don't stand. It's all right not to stand. It's okay. It's okay. Now, elders, I want you to reach out and touch somebody. And then once you're touched, reach back and touch somebody behind you. Put on back. Reach to somebody behind you and touch. Tell everybody is being touched. In the aisles, touch. In the balcony, touch. And I need help, Avondale. I want you to come down these steps. And you folk on this side, follow him. So we're all touching. We got to connect with the balcony. Somebody on this side, help me. Help me on this side. Move this way. Choir, you're touching. We got to connect with the balcony. Come on, someone. Someone, someone on the balcony. Move toward Avondale till we're touching. I want the bottom connected to the top. Please help me. I need a line touching along this side. I won't be satisfied. So the bottom is connected to the top. Come on, folks, back there. I need your help. Move this way. Move this way. Please help me. Please help me. Please help the pastor. We got to touch all the way through. That's it. Yeah, you got to connect here. Got to connect there. Stretch till we connect. Beautiful. They're doing it for me now. I'm satisfied. Thank you. That's precious up there. Thank you. Thank you.
You want everybody to repeat after me? I am made in God's image. But sin has messed me up. Fix me, Lord. Fix me, Lord. Don't stop till you've fixed me, Lord. Now as you're silent, I will pray. Lord, the pastoral staff has set a very, very bold goal that the church can be one. Today we have seen all the differences in us that make that a challenge. How can a melancholic get along with a sanguine? Not without Jesus. How can a phlegmatic become unirritated by a choleric? Not without Jesus. Not without Jesus. Because sin has emphasized our differences. We learned from Pastor Jeff this morning that we can be one in you. And, and as, as bodacious and impossible and beyond comprehension that seems, you prayed, you prayed that we would be one. Therefore, it is possible. There may be some broken, brokenness in some marriages here today. And, and the problem with marriages, Lord, as you well know, folk live together so long they just give up and they just exist. There's no real love, there's no real communication, they just, they just, they just get along. Seems to me, Lord, like something as wonderful as marriage should be more than just getting along. There's some young person here who has, who has not seen very much love in their home and, and, and they become cynical about it. And they, they, they just wonder if this whole thing about loving and, and being married and, and being united is just a joke. Help that young person know today that they don't measure God by human brokenness. There's somebody here in the sound of my voice listening to me online who's hurting, who's angry, who's become cynical about the church. They see all of us as a bunch of hypocrites, and they're right about that part. But they forget the church is God's fixing place. And so we admit, the members of Tacoma Park, Lord, we admit today, we're not finished yet. We're still a work in progress. But we are, by the grace of God, making progress. Somebody listening online, somebody in this church right now needs to say the magic words, I'm sorry. And then somebody else needs to see, say those words even more difficult than I'm sorry. I forgive. That rips my heart out. Because when I say I forgive, I'm submitting. I'm letting it go. And I want to see some blood. The only blood that counts is the blood shed on Calvary. So let not, Lord, this church be hindered by the pastor's delivery, by the pastor's fatigue, by the pastor not feeling that well today. Let the Word be empowered by the Holy Ghost who knows no fatigue, who has never been sick. Let the word invade minds in this place. May at least one person go home today saying, By the grace of God, I come. O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am trusting you to receive me. And being so thankful for being received, I now have joy in receiving others. To this end we have prayed. To this end we have given thanks. To this end we have joined and touched. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Return to your seats.